Hey, Amy. Yeah, Juan? Give me that beat. It's Baseball Shangri-La with Amy Cuevas and Juan Ramirez. What's up, party people? Welcome to another episode of Baseball Shangri-La. She is Amy Cuevas and I am Juan Ramirez. Let's get the business out of the way. Again, if you guys want to help us promote this show, help grow this show, if you are listening to this on the audio portion on the podcast, please make sure that you are subscribed to the podcast, you rate the podcast, and you write us a review. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel. Hit that notification button. Give us a thumbs up and give us comments and we're going to start the show the way we always start the show, and that is with our base running blunders. I thought I was perfect on the last show, but apparently, Amy, uh, I am not perfect because you have a base running blunder, and you refuse to tell me whether it's mine or it's yours. So we're going to find out right here on air who had the bla- base running blunder and what is the base running blunder, Amy? Dun, dun, dun. I love how how humble you are about this too, because I know you are perfect. So clearly, it it must be mine, right? Um, I'm sorry. What'd you say? You're perfect. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. I, I, these headphones are pretty bad here. <clears throat> You're perfect. It's amazing how I hear you much better when you whisper. <laughs> but I go ahead. I mean, go ahead and pronounce the the Detroit Tigers name the way you think it is before we start, just to for to refresh for all of our listeners. Yeah, it's Andre Lipschitz. Yeah, about that. So um, I went to the Detroit Tigers page and I looked up some of their their previous videography and it's actually Lipsius. So yeah, we're saying the same <laughs> I, thing, right? We're basically saying the same thing. Sounds like Lipschitz to me, but OK. I, yeah, so help, help, me, <laughs> so l- help me up here. So it's Andre Lipsius. Lipsius. Yes. Lipsius. Exactly. I, I, I admire your in-depth research that you actually went into the archives. Uh, that is actually hilarious to me. Well, so. I mean, we, we, we promised everybody we would do our homework. And w- I also went and we looked up um, De Paula's first name, the pronunciation. And you were correct. Um, actually found uh, something from one of our, our fellow podcasters, Tim Rogers of Dodgers 2080. He had some video where he was interviewing um, the player. We're about to uh, get his name pronounced correctly. Um, and so it is Hostway. So good job, Juan. I'm so, uh, thank you. So, mm-hmm. oh, so a big thank you to Tim Rogers there because on the broadcast they were pronouncing it as Josu. They were really trying to make Josu happen. And look, I, I get this. It's not sport. fetch, Juan. It's not fetch. <laughs> Stop trying to make fetch happen, Amy. But no, look, in a high school, there was a history teacher that his his last name was Rodriguez, but he spelled it with an S, right? And so everybody would like, hey, first day of school, Mr. Rodriguez. And he would get so mad. And he's like, it's Rodriguez. And we were just like sitting there going, oh, man, he, he's, he's fucking with us, right? It's that. But it, it was spelled with an S at the end. And that's what was my first exposure to Portuguese pronunciation. So I get it like when people were trying to push this Josu uh, pronunciation, but it is Josue. And thank you once again. See, this is the important uh, the importance of this segment, base running blenders, because we give you the truth here. We 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 don't mess around. And I I would go so far as to say sometimes it's not even uh, that people are are trying to make fetch happen. It's just I think that's a code switching thing where in in culture it's just you know this is what it looks like. This is what we're gonna do. And I know as part of the like the media packet that comes out at the beginning of the year, they usually will have like different pronunciations for the players' names. Like we'll hear, um, and I'm gonna butcher this because I don't remember what the media packet has. Like everybody says Vesia, but technically on the pronunciation packet it's Vasia. So like, I'm sure the players go through and have like how they want their name pronounced. And then 
media code switching, however it works out, it either gets Anglicanized or, you know, we get, we end up with a Josue because somebody doesn't ha- know how to pronounce it, but it is Josue. Thank you, Tim Rogers of Dodgers 2080. He does a lot of work with a lot of the, the Quakes players and, and people in the minor leagues. Check out his podcast. He's amazing. Um, but I was able to go to one of his older videos and, and get that pronunciation for us. And there we go. I mean, she's always dropping knowledge, but today she reminded me how funny she is where she's throwing the jokes. She's, she's making fetch happen. And and I love that Uh, before we break down and get into the show today. um, I do want to follow up with everybody. Uh, As I had mentioned, if you guys want to help us grow the show, especially on YouTube, we had asked for comments and we love it when you guys comment on our episodes. And so on our last episode, I shared with you the story of me in Giants country. And I had explained to you about how a waitress was giving me a hard time about being a Dodger fan. And I had asked you, the fans, how would you have handled the situation? How would you have reacted? And I got some really good uh, comments to the point where, honestly, I'm very jealous that I didn't think of these suggestions. Hey, there's always next year, Juan. It's not like you're not going to go back. (laughs) Well, that is true. I I mean, it may happen again next year, and I'll be able to go ahead and use these suggestions. So I want to thank you guys for giving me these. In particular, I I really do like Pablo's that in the tip section, Pablo said I should have just put go Dodgers, but then left a cash tip. I know there were some other people that were also just – suggesting the actual go Dodgers a in, in the tip section. But I, I still feel like she did provide good service. So it was important for me to leave her a tip, but I appreciate the, those kind of suggestions. And again, we love that kind of feedback on the show. We'd like to incorporate if there are topics, stuff that you guys want us to discuss, please, by all means, let us know either by commenting on the YouTube or hit us up on the social media, send us messages and we love to, we'll address it on the next episode, depending on when we get it. Yep. I would, I would, um, I would shadow that or, uh, we've, we've had some of the topics I think that we have discussed based on certain things that, that people have sent us and feedback we've received. So I think that definitely helps us drive the show and, and also make sure, making sure that we're connecting with you guys. So uh, thank you for everybody who has contributed so far in the past and, and thank you in advance for whatever you guys are going to share going forward. So uh, one of the things that we wanted to talk about on this show, uh, at the time that we are recording this show, the Dodgers are playing the Angels. Uh, they had a late game. Usually by the time Amy and I record, the Dodgers have already played. So we have an opportunity to go over the, the game. But uh, right now they're they're losing. They're down three nothing. We're gonna get to what we've seen so far. There, I, I think they're in the they're in the sixth inning right now, right, Amy? Oh, I'm gonna double check that. The last I checked, we were down three three zero. Um, and it looks like yeah, still three zero, top of the sixth. So we'll we'll keep you posted. <laughs> so we're still gonna go over some game notes, but before we get to that, there was a topic that uh, caught my attention, and I'm curious. Uh, to hear your reaction and I'd love to hear from our listeners or our viewers. Uh, so we all know what's going on with sports illustrated sports wait, Illustrated. Wait, yes. you're going to get out your, your thread conspiracy theory map out. So I just want to prepare everybody. So. Uh, I'm totally going uh, JFK Oliver stone here uh, or better yet. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. I had the Charlie day character. Yeah. I'm going to be like that. Yeah. So, and I shouldn't have done that because I just gave Amy a screen capture. Right now, I know she's going to go find up, that later. <laughs> she's going to end up using that one. So, um, oh no, here and we I go. Just get, I just gave her another one. Um, <laughs> but we all know that Sports Illustrated is no more. Um, I, when I was a kid growing up, Sports Illustrated, I, you know, I never really read Sports Illustrated. I always like, just like skimmed through the magazine and stuff like that, but I never. I never read the articles, but I was very aware that Sports Illustrated was a thing when I was a kid. At that time, it was a weekly magazine. Uh, you would all, I, what I remember a lot were the commercials. Like if you subscribe to Sports Illustrated, you would get like a phone or they were always giving out something special. Um, so Sports Illustrated, I grew up with it. it. 
always being a part of my life. And then recently, you know, in the past few years, it went from not being a weekly periodical, then it became a monthly periodical. So the writing was on the wall. You could see what was happening with magazines, with the whole publication, uh, you know, industry. So what I found interesting was, you know, all of a sudden Sports Illustrated is no more, but there are rumblings that Sports Illustrated may come back, but it's going to come back in a different form. So what it sounds like is they're still going to use the name Sports Illustrated, but it's not going to be the Sports Illustrated that you grew up or that you knew in the past, the, the magazine aspect of it. Which so, it hasn't been for a, for a while, to be fair. But No, I, I, and that, that is fair. That is fair. So one of the things that I found interesting is that the – all the major sports leagues put out a statement. Well, not necessarily put out a statement, but they did say this. The Player Association, this is coming not necessarily from the league, but the player associations of these major leagues. And we're talking about the NFL. We're talking about Major League Baseball, WNBA, Major League Soccer. Um, they all say that if that, that if this new version of Sports Illustrated, which is rumored, to be coming around that if it doesn't have union members, and this is what we're talking about. We're talking about pe people who write for sports illustrated. If they are not part of the union that they are not going to basically support it. So I'm going to read the full comment because the full statement, because it's very short, but on behalf of the thousands of player members, we stand in solidarity with unionized workers of sports illustrated. We are shocked to see that these journalists who have worked tirelessly to upload the integrity and the standards at Sports Illustrated were laid off as a result of a licensing dispute between the Arena Group, which publishes uh, uh, Sports Illustrated, and the Authentic Brands Group, its owner. Management has some decisions to make on the future of Sports Illustrated and who will have the, operate, uh, the right to operate the brand. We are watching this closely, and it is our expectation that Authentic and the Arena Group treat the social, uh, Sports Illustrated workers fairly and honor their union contract. If management replaces the brand's full-time unionized workforce, Sports Illustrated will no longer be Sports Illustrated. Our unions will always call out any attempt by management to treat their workers unfairly and demand that these union busting tactics at one of America's most important journalistic institutions stop now from the playing surface to the press box sports jobs are union jobs. And that was a statement from the AFL hyphen C I O sports council uh, in they represent the sports illustrated staff. So I, I found that very interesting that it I, obviously I think it's expected that that statement come from the players union. But I mean, we're going to get into this right now, Amy, this whole idea of not paying workers, uh, paying them what they I, and I do agree with them, with them saying like now I'm starting to think, OK, you guys basically disbanded Sports Illustrated. Did you do this in order to do a work around it? This is a union busting tactic. Uh, what were your thoughts uh, when I sent you this story, Amy? So my initial thoughts, because it's been a, a busy last week where I, I had only peripherally heard about this. So I had mostly no idea what you were talking about. <laughs> I had to go dig into some of the data just to to see what was going on. So just to kind of back up for anybody else who's not up to speed on this, that like the overarching thing is um, the publisher missed a payment on the publishing rights, which is what led to all these layoffs. So quick history, because this is what I found out today when I was researching. Um, the Authentic Brands Group, which is ABG, that's a it's a brand management firm. They purchased Sports Illustrated for 110 million in 2019. Um, they, at that time, laid off 30% of the staff then. Um, then ABG granted the parent company, Maven, which is now known as the Arena Group, publishing rights and, and licensing the media. Arena Group is the one who missed the quarterly payment back to ABG. 
And so when ABG revoked the licensing agreement, that caused the arena group to lay off the majority of the, of the Sports Illustrated writing force. So this was all like, okay, now I get the bigger picture here. So some of the people were laid off immediately. Others are going to be laid off over the next 90 days. It's a little over 100 employees. Um, but they did make a statement which stuck out to me. And so the arena group mentioned that they will continue to produce Sports Illustrated articles until the issues are resolved. But if you've laid off the majority of your writing force, that that's my question. How are you gonna how are you gonna write without the writers? Like, how are you going to continue to produce content without the people that you literally just laid off, which I think gives credence to your yarn conspiracy theory map there of like, are they trying to, you know, re restructure this? I, I don't know. Like, I, I just don't understand how you're going to do that with the right without the writers. And, and to be fair, uh, there is no, there has not been anything that no statement that sports illustrated is going to be, it's going to continue, but in a new form that is just spear spec. That is just sheer speculation on my part. But the statement here from these unions, these players unions, I feel like they're on the same page as I am, where they're basically this is a warning shot being sent across the bow saying, if you guys are thinking of rebranding Sports Illustrated, which is a.k.a. we're going to start something new. We fully expect you to have union members, union writers, a part of this rebranding. I'm imagining you all standing back like this, just admiring, you know, all of the little, the yarn pins and everything of where everything goes, just all of you together, just on the same page. Um, uh, this I, is back and to the left, back <laughs> and to the left. <laughs> We're not even going to get into that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just, I guess for me, the, this just is, it harkens to, you and I have talked about this before. The media landscape is changing with with the advent of digital media. And a lot of the articles that I was reading and some of the, the videos that I watched to prepare for this, they were talking about like when Sports Illustrated initially started, when it was, you know, a weekly publication, that was your touch point with the players. Like that's how you got to know what players were saying because you didn't always get an interview after the game. We didn't have immediate access. I mean, I remember growing up where you didn't really hear play like my dad would have the Lakers on or a Dodgers game and the most you heard from players was like hey how do you feel after winning this game like oh I want to go to Disneyland and like that was that was what I remember about players back then and so if this was your touch point that's obviously not the case anymore players are driving their own social media they're out there meeting with fans and so that is going to change the landscape of one, how we cover teams, how we cover players and how people access the information. Uh, people are, we're in a more fast paced world. We have a lot of things going on all at once. We're juggling many things. Uh, some people don't have time to sit down and read a, a 2000 page article. I give it to me in, in video form, give it to me quick or give it to me in little snippets. But this, this for better or worse, digital media has changed the landscape of, of how we look at, you know, the media. Uh, I'm going to be a dick right now and save you from a base running error. Uh, yeah, nobody has time to read a 2,000 page article. I believe you were referring to a 2,000 word article. 2, Thank you. Oh my God. Thanks for the assist there. No, See, I'm going to do I, it again. I, I know our listeners and our viewers are sticklers and they're waiting to point out a base running error, but you bring up a very interesting point in terms of this new media because you and I were part of this new media. Because of technology, it has allowed us to necessarily enter the world of gatekeepers, whether people like it or not, whether we were invited, we kind of like put our foot through that door and said, you know, we're here. Hi. Um, <laughs> but this whole idea of not paying the worker uh, for, for their work or paying them what's due, this is something that we're seeing across the world increasing. I mean, this is what the strike or the writer strike over the summer was all about because I, you know, I, I know people that use AI to, to write stuff. It, it makes me cringe. And that's because I have friends who are writers and I know how hard and the talent that is required 
to, to so when people use AI, whether it is to write something or even now I'm hearing, you know, other stuff, it, it does make me cringe. Did and we learn nothing from the cautionary tale of Terminator 2, Miles Dyson, and just what happened? Did we learn nothing? So what you're saying is that Skynet is really the one that's running Sports Illustrated. Is that what we're talking about here? I mean, that was part of one of the articles I read was that one of the, the CEOs got, got the hatchet for, you know, some of the AI-driven articles that they were doing. And so let's go ahead and hit it. Nerd alert! That was <laughs> definitely a nerd alert coming in terms of a Terminator reference, not by me. But by Amy, Amy Terminator was that, two, technically. Yeah, that is true. A Terminator two reference. Uh, but it, it is fascinating because, again, we saw it with the writer's strike over the summer, but we also saw it with the L.A. Times in terms of what they were doing with their sports coverage. It, you know, right before spring training set. And I think it was even maybe right before Dodgers Fest. They had laid off the Dodgers beat writer. Now. They laid off the beat writer for probably the most popular sport, a baseball team in America right now. And their plan was what they were going to use the Associated Press's coverage of it and run it in the L.A. Times. Or they still had other writers, but these are writers that were com columnists. They weren't beat writers now. I did reach out for the LA Times to the LA Times. I invited someone on the LA Times to come out and discuss this on this show. I received no response. And what I found interesting was the minute I sent that, Amy, two days later, Jack Harris got hired back to the LA Times. So, so what yes. I'm hearing is you got Jack Harris rehired? Damn right I did. Because <laughs> the LA Times, they didn't want any of this smoke, Amy. They did not want the smoke because on this program, we hold their feet to the fire. But not only so I'm I applaud them for hiring Jack Harris because you and I re rehiring re Jack re rehiring, rehiring him. <laughs> Look, you and I, we've worked with him before. He's very good at what he does. So and I don't want anybody to lose their job. So I am very glad that they reversed course on that and they brought him back. But at the same time, I'm extremely disappointed to see Jorge Castillo left the L.A. Times and now he's working for ESPN. I think Jorge Castillo was one of the best columnists. If not, you could make an argument. He was the best col sports columnist in the L.A. Times and they lost him. And I'm sure that what he did was he saw the tea leaves and he was just like, I need to get out of here. I, I need and, and I don't blame him. You're looking for job security now. Also. Jorge is from the East Coast, so I'm sure it, he's covering the Yankees and the Mets now. So I'm sure it doesn't hurt him that he's now back on the East Coast and, you know, closer to family. But it, it is disconcerting because I pay. I am a subscriber to the Los Angeles Times and the people that I read, you know, losing Castillo, it hurts. But again, I'm glad that Jack Harris is back there. But you had mentioned something, and the reason why I think it's important that we have journalists is because we are entering or we have been in an era where you have team controlled media. So the media, the teams, they're going to put out the narrative that they want out. And I think what's interesting is now that has also relayed to the players. I think the players now are taking the initiative. They're controlling their own narrative. That's why Mookie Betts has his own podcast. That's why you see more and more players go on shows. I know we're going to talk about geek as appearance on foul territory, but you're right. This, this is changing now. This is, this is the wild wild west in terms of media. We cannot cover things the way we do it on, in, in the past. Now, you know, a lot of people are getting their news. The majority of the people, I think, get their news now from social media. Well, and, and that's something where, like, you evolve or die, right? So the L.A. Times has you have a subscription. You get you get your articles online. Not everybody is still getting that that physical paper newspaper. Some people still love that harkens back to like, I, I want to me. I like feeling a book in my hand versus having my Kindle. I do both because. 
again, life moves fast and I can have a whole library in my hand. But that, but that's, pe people are either going to evolve in that way or things are going to happen like Sports Illustrated. I don't know how often they're going online versus, you know, sending out that, that monthly magazine, what they're doing to supplement. But we, it is a changing landscape and it will be interesting to see how it evolves, but we still need writers. We still need people who are providing that content. And I just, I would hope that they get paid a fair wage for what they're doing because they, they are doing the work. It's not like even us coming on this show, we don't just come up here and just talk about whatever. We're both doing our research beforehand so that we're not just giving you guys a load of BS. I, it's important to me to have integrity in what we're presenting. And yes, we're going to make mistakes. Yes, sometimes they are opinions, but at the same time, we're both trying to do the best that we can to bring information, you know, out into the world. No, I, I, absolutely. And one of the things, too, uh, I, I guess we can go ahead and get into this now. But it, it, it seems all across, not only just in media, it, it just seems everything is they want cheap labor. Let's let's reduce the cost of, of labor. And you I had mentioned it. So let's just segue into it right now. A geek, I believe it was last week. For the record, I just want everybody to know you're bringing up geek A this time and not me. This this is not me. So go for it. Um, geek A, I believe he, it was after he signed with the Dodgers. So I think he was on foul territory. It was last, last week. Thursday, um, the 29th. And he had some very strong comments on the fact of how long it took him to get signed and the number of free agents that are still out there. And I mean, did he basically come out and then say collusion or you, you had to read between the lines there, right, Amy? He alluded to it. He said that him and other players agree that it's sketchy, that he wasn't going to use the C word, but if somebody was going to use the C word, it needed to have a capital C, which is interesting because the prior day foul territory had had Tony Clark, the, um, the CEO of the, the MLB players association or the executive director, sorry. Um, and he had said that it was peculiar and he was loath to use the C word as well, but you've got people who are just dancing around it now. So Tony Clark saying it's peculiar that this is happening. We've got Kike and other players saying that it's sketchy, but essentially a lot of players are unsigned and and everybody can agree that there was more viewership last year the numbers in baseball are up so for the for the players to be unsigned it it's odd uh, and that's kind of the consensus at least from the players side at this point there is an unwillingness to share the wealth is what it seems and and, and again this may be the market correcting ourselves be uh, correcting itself because we don't know with the numbers we hear especially in the off season where they were, whether they were true or not. Like the fact that Cody Bellinger was expected to sign a $200 million contract and he ended up signing an $80 million contract. So it, it could be like, no, this is what he's worth. He, and people have always said this, you're worth whatever you're getting paid for. Right. They did bring up, though, that a majority of the, the ownership or the teams are using this proprietary software. And even though it may be proprietary to each team, they all have the same software. So if Kike is getting, he said it was interesting when he was reached out to. So it was usually in a group all at the same time, and then it would go quiet all at the same time. But the people who were reaching out were offering pretty much the same amount. So the timing of the calls, the amounts that were offered were similar. And a lot of the, the people approaching him and some of the other players he's talked to would give a deadline. Well, hey, you need to make a decision in a day or we're going to offer this to somebody else. And so one of the things that he mentioned and they were discussing on the Foul Territory um, show was essentially everybody's using the same software, but it can't take into account essentially what we talk about a lot, the humanity, injuries, the health of a player. So it's generating all this information based off of the stats, but it can't tell you that Kike had a double hernia. Tony Gonsolin had this going on. Clayton Kershaw had this. So it's spitting out a number of what you're worth. And it's not even taking into account a lot of these things like Jason Hayward's leadership, Kike's personality, Rojas's personality in the clubhouse. Those things, some of those things are priceless, and that should be factored into what these guys are bringing to a team in addition to what they're bringing on the field. No, I, I it, it is fascinating to hear all that stuff. Now, of course, this is one person's opinion. 
how many other players share Geeka's opinion, but are reluctant to come forth. And this is again, what I was talking about in, in, in an era where I believe the p- players are using this new media to help control the narrative or necessarily, I don't know, even out the narrative because the owners are going to put out their version of the truth. The players are going to put out their version of the truth and somewhere the truth lies in, in the middle. Right. But I do think you can't lose sight because I don't think this is anything new. I don't think this is just this off season. I think it it's been happening the last few off seasons. And I know that people are going to sit there and say, Juan, how can you say that when Shohei Otani got seven hundred million dollars and Yamamoto got three hundred million dollars? Look, all of these are exceptions. Those guys are exceptions to the rule. OK, as we sit here. You know, we're about two weeks away, almost two weeks away from the Dodgers starting their season in Korea. And you still have Blake Snell out there. You still have Uh, Jordan Montgomery. The Cy Young winner, by the way. He won the Cy Young, and he still has not been signed by a team. Sorry, I interrupted you. (laughs) <laughs> no, and, and, and J.D. Martinez is still out there. So you still have players out there that are unsigned. And the question is, why? Right? Because there are probably 30 teams. And I include the Dodgers in there, and we're going to get to that right now. But there are 30 teams that could use any of those players that I just mentioned right now. And you talked about it. I I, I mean... Let's talk about this. Is this a sh- is it shady that Geek has said the Dodgers had reached out to him about signing him, but they were basically telling him we have to trade Margot first before we can sign you. And then Geek pulled what we saw on social media when those reports were le- leaked. You know, uh, those reports were leaked that he's going to make his decision on Monday. And these are the teams that was Kike applying pressure to the Dodgers saying, look, get this done now or I'm going to take an offer somewhere else. Well, and And he did mention there were there were four teams that got leaked as far as who were interested in him. And he shared that it wasn't even actually those two teams. It was between the Dodgers and the Yankees. So yes. it wasn't the Giants, the Padres, the I think it was the Twins, and I don't remember yep. who the other, the fourth one was. But it, it ended up being, you know, totally different teams that were that were in on that. And so if he did apply pressure, did you know, did that factor in? And again, and I bring this up because it is the parallel of what's happening with writers, I think is something that's been happening with Major League Baseball. Have the salaries gotten out of hand in sports, not just in baseball, but in all sports? And now the owners are trying to go ahead and and bring these salaries down. But hey, look, the owners are the ones to blame for this because they're the ones that hand out these so-called ridiculous contracts. But I've always said this, if they're going to pay Shohei Otani $700 million, it's because they can afford to pay him $700 million. So if Shohei's getting $700 million, how much money are the Dodgers making off of him? Because this is capitalism, right? This is a business. They're in this business to make money. So if they agree to, I can give you $700 million, can you imagine how much more money they're making off of him? Between endorsements and even just the the annual revenue from season ticket holders and knowing that they are going to fill a stadium every year, the merch that people are buying. Like, can you even imagine what was spent just on the the pre-orders for for Otani and Yamamoto jerseys? Like, it has to be, I mean, significant. So, but... But that just shows the Dodgers are putting money back into the team, which is what we've talked about before versus some of the other teams, um, you know, that are kind of taken from that that pool. And and we're not really seeing results there either. I know that uh, our listeners, our viewers are going to be like, there goes Juan again with, you know, his conspiracy theories. And I like I know that I cannot prove collusion. And I know that in some instances, there are people that will believe this is not an example. There's no proof that this is collusion. But the fact that Kike has said what he said on that show, and I have not heard anyone refute it. Uh, have you, Amy? 
I haven't. And even even the guys on the Foul Territory podcast were like, wow, you know, that's the most honest interview somebody has given on free agency that, you know, that we've ever heard, like good, essentially good for him. But like even just some of the stuff that he said that really humanized the process, like these guys are are wanting to play. And he's essentially sitting at home waiting for a call. Like that's the same thing that Snell and Montgomery are doing right now. The fact that that Lucas Giolito j- could need surgery, he could miss out on the 2024 season with the Red Sox. And now potentially Snell and Montgomery might have a shot at getting signed a little sooner. Like that's that's unfortunate. Like it shouldn't take somebody who who has a torn UCL and a and a flexor strain to potentially move the market for these guys who are, you know, for all intents and purposes, they're good at what they do. It's so, I mean, and and for those of you who are not aware, it was reported uh, that Lucas Giolito might be out for the season uh, with his injury. And it's interesting because that was a picture that I, I had thought was going to end up on the Dodgers before we saw all this madness takes place in the off season. I thought Giolito would be someone that they would use for the back end of their rotation at that, you know, again, Mark Pryor being the wizard that he was, that he is, would be able to fix Giolito. And I know everyone now is so grateful that, oh, the Dodgers, you know, they dodged a bullet here by not getting Giolito. But just to hear that injury and that, you know, to hear that news, it's just a reminder of how fragile pitching is and the fact that a lot of the not a lot but the Dodgers to me have a a significant number of players that have are coming back from injury or have injury a an injury plagued uh history so to speak so it concerns me because the greatest indicator of future injury is past injury so that being said, with the Lucas Giolito news and the fact that I heard, I saw this a lot on social media where people were just like, Scott Boris must be cheering right now when he sees the news because does this mean now the Red Sox have to up up an offer to, to get Blake Snell or to get Jordan and Montgomery? Are these guys now Snell and Montgomery, are they going to get the numbers that they were originally looking for because now teams are desperate? Now, that being said, I know this is, once again, this is fantasy. This is not reality, right? But I keep seeing this out in social media where it was leaked that Blake Snell is open to taking a deal similar to what Cody Bellinger did, where it would he would have opt-outs. Maybe it's a shorter amount of time, bigger amount of money, but with the, with the opt-out. Maybe it's not as long as what he was originally looking for. And I think that's what Matt Chapman just did. So you've got two Boris clients who both have these interesting contracts compared to where we thought they would be. And they have, you know, he has like opt outs going the next couple of years with his three or 54 million. So that's two of the Boris four that have a, a different structured contract than what we thought was going to happen in the market this year. And and keep me honest here, uh, uh, Amy, the Dodgers are all already over the tax threshold. Yes. So any money they spend now, they're paying the full blown tax on it. There is they're paying double for some of these people. So and that's why when people are like, ah, it's not my money to spend, like whatever, but it's like, okay, but you're not paying market value for whatever this contract is. You're paying market value plus the tax penalty. Before the Giolito injury, I was like, is there there's no way. There's no way that the Dodgers could convince, let's say, Blake Snell to take a one-year deal or or take an option because because of the, the the situation that they're at, that because of the fact that they, like you said, it's not just whether they give him thirty million; it's not thirty million because of the tax that the Dodgers are going to be be paying. I think now with this Giolito injury, it changes things. I think this whole fantasy that the that Dodger fans have out there that the Dodgers will somehow be able to steal Blake Snell or steal Jordan Montgomery, you know, and I feel like, you know, we're calling this episode bargain shopping because I feel like up until this Lucas Giolito injury, the Dodgers, I don't know if they were done. I think maybe they were looking in the bin to see, is there anything we can buy at our price? 
you know, that, that would be worth it. I think this is a reminder too, like that our front office does know what they're doing because at the trade deadline last year, you and I were having conversations about this of like, you know, where is Giolito going to end up? And I didn't want him. He ended up with the angels. And then we saw what happened with his record. He went, I think one in five. And then now you have this, this injury that's coming to, it's almost like the front office is prescient. Like, okay, well, now he's having this surgery and poor guy. Like I, I would never want that to happen to somebody. But again, like some people are saying on social media, we dodged a bullet and it's just unfortunate. I mean, I guess it works out in Snell and Montgomery's favor if they end up getting signed in a situation like this, but you know, poor Giolito, he's going to miss potentially a year or more, you know, depending on if he opts for surgery or not. And and again, this is what's fascinating to me, right? Because when Lucas Giolito got signed by the Red Sox, people were like astonished at how much money he got out of the Red Sox. So it's it's interesting that they're they're willing to overplay on some, on some players, and I get it. Overpaying on Lucas Giolito is not the same amount of giving Blake Snell two hundred seven two hundred seventy million dollars. I'm sure that's exactly how the Red Sox justify that. It's like, look, we can overpay here. It's not 270 million that, that we're spending. So they are willing to spend, but going back to what Kike had said, if all the teams were offering the same numbers and you said it, they're using the same program. It, it's just one of those things where it's like, what is that? Uh, Again, I I know I'm desperate sounding here that I want to prove my conspiracy theory, but I'll send you some more yarn. It's okay. <laughs> thank you. I, I I need a bigger board, but it is just it's been very fascinating to me because I, I I'm like, how much longer can these guys wait and still be ready for the season with Jordan Montgomery? And I know that those guys are probably still working out. And how much time do they need to get ready? And is that something that maybe make them more susceptible to injury? Like, and it's not the same though. That's and Freddie said it. You can practice all you want at home. Freddie Freeman was talking about that earlier in spring training. You can practice all you want, but until you throw those cleats on and you're in a competitive situation, it's not the same kind of training. And I think this just goes back to what we were talking on the last episode. And I think this is what Kike was alluding to. And I think even a little bit Tony Clark when he was, you know, when he's been interviewed. We look at stats, but that is not, you can't look at the game as black and white. There are so many shades of gray in baseball. These people are humans. You just brought up the point that these guys are fragile. You, you get injured once you're, you're more likely to get injured again. Like these, these guys are, are people. Barnes just got scratched today because of, um, I think it was back tightness. And so, you know, he's probably fine, but they're going to be very careful and, and monitor that. And they had um, another catcher come in. Oki came in today. And but these guys, they're doing repetitive stuff over and over again at at almost superhuman levels. We need to factor that in. And no computer program is ever going to be able to to take that into consideration, what these guys bring to the game outside of just the black and white stats. And it's just a reminder because not only Lucas Giolito, but we also heard news today that Justin Verlander is going to start the season on the injured list. So it is once again a reminder. I don't think you can have enough pitching. So, you know, if the Dodgers decide we're going to get more pitchers, we're going to get more pitchers, we need more depth. I, I'm all for it. I just feel like this Lucas Giolito injury is a game changer in terms of the market. I fully expect now to see Blake Snell or Jordan Montgomery sign fair, you know, fairly soon with the team uh, because I don't know if it's fair to say that a team is going to panic, but I, I don't know if that's if the strategy of waiting it out is, is going to work any longer as we get closer to the season. I mean, I don't know any major league baseball player that is willing to miss time basically essentially a holdout and i i don't i don't see it coming i, I could and they wrong. and they know their worth too to a certain extent like uh, yes we we don't even know if it was confirmed that cody would have gotten 200,000 but he knows his worth he's not taking like a piddly contract because he did turn his season around last year can can that be sustained that remains to be seen um i know we're 
kind of just getting into some of this the the game notes too. Speaking of pitchers, Bobby Miller pitched today. He yes. went another three innings today through 42 pitches, faced 11 hitters, two hits, um, no earned runs. He walked somebody, struck somebody else out. Um, he's got a, a 180 ERA. Like he's he's kind of trucking along. And um, if nobody had noticed yet, he's actually changed his number. So instead of being number 70, he is now number 28 this year. Oh, I, I was very aware of that, uh, Amy, because I believe you are ho- uh, lighting a candle for number 28. Uh, the reason why it caught my eye that he is now number 28 is because Juan Pedro Guerrero wore number 28 for the Dodgers. And again, Pedro has Guerrero, been lit. <laughs> Pedro Guerrero, aside from Fernando Valenzuela, was one of my favorite Dodgers growing up. So. Whenever I see the number 28, I always get very, very excited because it reminds me of Pedro Guerrero. But look, I I know we have to sit here, take this with caution, right? It is spring training, but you can't help but be encouraged for him to have the outing that he had. Would I have liked for him to, you know, go? What did he go? Did he go three innings? Three full innings, yeah. Yeah, so he went three full innings. So we're going to start to see some of the starters get stretched out. I mean, his ERA so far in spring training is under two. And I think that's very encouraging because, again, you're going to have Yamamoto. You're going to have Glasnow. You're going to have Bobby Miller. Those are the guys, at at least at the beginning of the season, who the Dodgers are going to be leaning on in that rotation. I still think it's up in the air what you're going to get out of Paxton. Uh, and then who ends up getting that fifth spot? You know, right now it's looking like Gavin Stone has a real nice shot. So anytime we, I see the starters going out there and putting out numbers like this, it's it's encouraging. Yes, I know this doesn't necessarily mean it's going to translate into their regular season, but that's what spring training is all about, right? Is developing good habits. So if you have habits right now that are delivering results you hope that that goes ahead and translates to the regular season yeah and that's i think that's how we're gonna have to take today's game right now we uh the angels are still leading four to zero they're in the i think it looks like they just finished the the bottom of the eighth so we've got one inning to come back they've come back in in later innings games but at the same time it's it's spring training like just just enjoy it I, I love that this is the disappointment is is clear in terms of this would be the Dodgers third loss in spring training. And we it's like, oh, my God, the Dodgers lost. And it's like, guys, it's spring training. I, Amy, I, I want to end the show with this. I don't know if you saw this tidbit uh, because the Dodgers are playing the Angels today. And this is the first time in spring training that Shohei, who actually played in the game, and I believe he struck out twice. Did he get a third at bat, Amy? Uh, let me let me double check. It looks like he went. Dun, dun, dun. Um, he had three at bats. He, he struck out twice, so looks like he went over three. So this was Otani's first time facing his former team. Now there was a report earlier that he wanted to stay with the Angels, but the Angels were reluctant to match the seven hundred million dollar offer that the Dodgers did. And primarily the reason why they were reluctant was because of the amount of the deferrals. Uh, So it has become very clear and talking about someone who has been controlling his own narrative with new media. Shohei is definitely you don't know anything about Shohei unless he wants you to know about it. But it, it has been said that he was the one that had the idea for the deferrals. So it seems like that amount of money being deferred is something that Artie Moreno of the Angels was not comfortable with. And I don't... Look, Artie Moreno has been criticized very heavily, and I would probably say it was it is deserved. But even when I heard the amount of the deferrals, I was, I was surprised about that too. And then I know players, I think Justin Turner even said it, you know, was just like... Well, of course, current ownership doesn't care about the deferrals because they're not going to be the ones paying it. There's this belief that they're by the time Otani's gone, they're going to sell the Dodgers and it'll be the new owner's problem. Uh, Your reaction to that story that the Angels could have kept Otani if they would have accepted the deferrals. 
I, that's one of the ones that doesn't measure for me. I'm just like, all right, okay, they could have, but they didn't. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think the one that gets me actually a little bit more is all of this conspiracy theory about, like, Mookie, you know, shook hands with, you know, Freddie, and now Freddie's on the team. Shook hands with Shohei, and now Shohei's on the team, and then you see him interacting with Mike Trout, and, you know, the conspiracy is that Mike Trout will come over. As far as Art Moreno... He he it, he doesn't surprise me. I just you know, <laughs> I'm probably wow. it's the lack of like surprise for me that's just like yeah, I, all right. <laughs> Who's playing with the yarn now with the oh. the Mookie bets? Uh, I mean, you're going full yarn right there. Oh, I I bet. said I said that's what's on the socials. I think that's more entertaining to me than you know. Are we shocked though that that Art Moreno didn't you know keep him? Do what was best for the team. And, and, the, the and this is this is what I'm saying. It is it is just becoming increasingly more difficult to defend him. And I know I you know poor Angel fan. Look, I I was a fan going back to the Frank McCord era. I know what it feels like to have an owner that you feel is hurting your team more than helping your team. And so. I have friends who are angel fans and when they got so excited, when they heard that Artie was going to sell the team and then he does an about face and goes, just kidding. Uh, yeah, I think it, it's, it's tough to be an angel fan right now because not only do you see Otani leave, which was probably the only reason to go see, look, I love that Mike Trout has been buried and people have just, you know, forgotten about him and given up on that guy that somehow Mike Trout is no longer, a good baseball player, but I can see how it is frustrating times right now for, for those angel fans. So, and I think um, that's a reminder for us just of how, I don't want to, I don't want to say spoiled in this sense, but how, like what a great ownership group we have that they are pouring money into the team, into putting a, a quality product onto the field for us to come watch and enjoy. Like we have a pretty great ownership group. Like it's, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> So what did we learn today, class? What we learned today is people deserve to be paid what they're worth, and we need to pay them, whether they're writers or they are Major League Baseball players. Uh, and how do we say Andre's name again? Lipschitz. <sighs> All right. Demerit. In the corner. Put your dunce hat on. <laughs> That's going to do it for this show. Amy, is there any last words before we wrap things up? It's Lipsius. Okay, El ellipsis. Andre <laughs> ellipsis, everyone. Okay. <laughs> uh, make sure you're following us for you guys listening on the audio portion. Make sure uh, that you are subscribed to the podcast. Please rate us, write us a review. Uh, if you're on YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit that notification button. Give us that thumbs up. Write us comments. What did you think about the episode? What do you want to discuss in future episodes? Follow us on social media on X at BB Shangri LA, on Instagram, threads, and Twitch at Baseball Shangri LA. This has been another episode of Baseball Shangri LA. She is Amy Cuevas, and I am Juan Ramirez. Amy, say goodbye to the people. Goodbye, people.